Thanks so much for having me. I, I feel like all the other speakers were taller than me. Um, I feel like um, I frustrated James with two reasons. First, I have a peak in the title without defining it. That's a very academic thing to do. Uh, peak is promote, promoting employment across Kansas. It's the flagship um, incentive program that was designed uh, in 2009. Uh, if you want to sort of think of what does it look like on average, the incentives are around $2 million. Um, for a proposed number of jobs. I think the average in my data set is 95 jobs for $2 million. I'm actually going to talk about whether those are actually jobs that were created as part of the program or this incentive just added to what the company was going to do. But it's, think of it as, uh, as the Marquee Kansas uh, incentive program. And I'm specifically performing a policy evaluation of this program. And I said, James is a little frustrated. I, I, I was very academic with my title. Um, I also have to leave early um, because I have a one and three year old. So I already have to uh, buy flowers for my wife. Um, I can't stay too much longer than this. Um, so he moved me up uh, earlier in the presentation. Uh, I'm not from Wichita, um, but I actually have family here. Um, I, my brother in law works in aviation. His wife is an engineer in aviation. They have four kids in the public schools uh, in Wichita. He's very upset that I'm leaving early. Um, so I care about what happens in this community. Um, but what my, my purpose here is just to present academic research. And I lived in Missouri for 12 years before this, which partially explains why I was looking at Kansas. And I'm doing a, a companion uh, evaluation of the Missouri incentive programs. So it's a policy evaluation. I think it's always helpful to give some pe you know, people, who, I, who am I, and not just like, who am I, what is my title? What's my goal here? Why am I here? What do I get out of this? Um, I'm an academic researcher. I teach classes, and I can bring in what I talk to you and learn from you into my classroom. But I'm also an academic where I'm trying to produce the best policy analysis I can. And these papers go through peer review, meaning they take the name, my name, off a paper, they send it to a journal, they send it to a bunch of experts. The experts criticize the paper, either it gets rejected or you, get the bill, you have the opportunity to change it. The point being that I, I hopefully our interests are aligned here in the sense that I want to do this right, and you probably want to see an, an, a program of value evaluated as correctly as possible. So that's why I'm here. Uh, but hopefully what I can give you is, you know, one, I'll give you an evaluation of a single program. But two, I think what I'm going to have to say here at the end of this presentation is, one, what you're proposing to do here is really hard, to actually use incentives to generate real jobs, right? And to do it in a way that's not burning taxpayer dollars, that it's not generating moral hazard or perverse incentives by firms, it is really hard to do. And this is not to say that you haven't tried hard, that there isn't a lot of energy, but this is something that's fundamentally difficult to do. And it's hard to just pick a model from another city. There are cities that have been successful, but is it their incentive program? And how do we know whether it's that incentive program that was successful? So the second thing I'm going to say is it's really hard. I'm telling you, I've, I've been sweating working on this project for months. It's really hard to evaluate one single incentive program after the fact, after you get the details. And part of what I'm going to pitch to you here is, you know, again, I'm not an interested party in, in what you're going to do with the sales tax initiative, but I think you should build in some serious program evaluation if you move forward. And I mean really serious evaluation. That you're going to think systematically, how do we know whether these jobs are actually being created by these incentives? Or we're just using this money to give, give companies money to do stuff they were going to do anyways. Right? And that's the biggest concern with most of these incentive programs, the redundancy of the incentive programs. Um, given the, the great questions here, I would like to speed up a little bit. I was going to talk a little bit about the, um, the history of incentives. Can people hear me okay here? Um, the history of incentives. Um, you know, this, this just mirrors what the previous presentation said. Incentives are very common. Uh, data is, again, around 95% of cities offer some, so, some sort of incentive, although it's, you know, sometimes they're not easily comparable. Um, I lived in St. Louis for 12 years, and they're building an Ikea right next to where I lived. It's one of the few Ikeas right in the middle of the city. And it's through a huge TIF, um, tax incremental financing, and a bunch of other infrastructure incentives. Um, so there's a lot of different types of incentive programs by cities and states. Um, but what's interesting, uh, I think at least, is you know, why do we see these incentives? And, and, and I often talk to economists and say, I'm studying these incentives, and they laugh at me and say, well, you know these things don't work. We have decades of research that says they don't work. Why do you care? And I said, well, I was trained as a political scientist. I'm curious why. 
Over and over again do we see similar types of policies that have used, in a lot of countries rolled back, promoted in the United States. And so it's a sort of a political science question. And some of my survey research of voters are, you know, voters want you to do something. And it's something tangible that politicians can do, right, that you can put on the table that we're creating jobs, we're trying to create jobs. But it's not clear it works. And this is not, again, to kick sand on, on this proposal. It's that there is a political logic to you know, public policy. And politicians are doing their best to generate jobs in their districts, and it's hard. And this is a toolkit that's been used by many other states. Um, but my, my goal here is to evaluate whether this is the right toolkit to use. Again, there's lots of tools you can use and lots of things you can do for your community. Um, I'm, actually, I'm actually trained um, in international business, international political economy. Um, so I always have a, you know international perspective. How's the US look? And again, we're often really focused either on what other cities or states are doing or just simply how jobs are being outsourced to different countries. But you know what's actually kind of interesting too is to look at the policies of other countries. What are other countries doing? Are they using these incentive programs as well? And especially countries that are rich, that have you know, very high labor, um, sorry, high wage rates, some of the same issues here, are they seeing the same types of outsourcing to the same countries we are? Um, if we just you know, really quickly talk a bit about the United States, we could just say that the US actually looks a little bit like the Wild West. The US is one of the few countries that we see such incre some incredible competition across cities that's allowed by the central government, but also even in countries where it's not allowed, you just don't see the same sort of incentive wars. You don't see it with cash on the table or financial incentives. Often you'll see it as low interest loans. This is what you see in Canada often. So the US looks kind of unique and, and whether that's a good thing or bad thing, I'll let you uh, evaluate yourself. But it makes it kind of hard to look across the world and say, how do we do what these other countries are doing? How do we learn from the best practices of others? And for the most part, it's hard to say that incentives are, are clearly part of that best practice. Um, what is the economic logic for incentives? So I want to give the, the economic case, and, and you probably all have heard this, but I also want to you know, give the case against incentives as well. And the simple case that you hear in most of the economics literature is that there might be really good reasons why, think, when you think about Silicon Valley, that there's some spillovers. There's a catalyst for economic development. The best case example is Costa Rica. Um, Costa Rica is actually a relatively, you know, lower middle income, lower, higher of the lower income, um, of the low income countries, doing mostly textiles. And they actually moved up dramatically in what they produced, and largely through the attraction of Intel. There's a huge Intel production facility in Costa Rica. They did that partially with incentives. They actually did it a lot by coupling with their universities. They actually got the universities to provide the skills that Intel needed. And they did a number of important things like infrastructure investment. The point being, they attracted Intel, but the good news is it actually had spillovers across the whole country. So now you have biotech, you have uh, uh, some shared services, all moving to Costa Rica. It's a great example of how you can promote economic development. The problem is we don't have that many other examples of this, right? But that's at least the logic is that there's a catalyst that will have some positive spillovers. Um, I was looking at the South African investment pr uh, promotion agencies, and they have a model of how they calculate how many jobs are generated per incentive. And they attracted a bunch of chemical companies and uh, a number of concrete companies. And the, the ratio they had was 13 to 1. So they gave an incentive of $15 million to a company to come. They brought 100 jobs, but they said, no, 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 but it really generates 15 times that amount of indirect jobs. That's a crazy number. If you actually look at the US commerce estimates, it's 1.3 jobs at best per investment. The, the point being, these spillovers often, if you look at some of the economic data, are actually much more limited than people make them out to be. But at least the logic is clear that there are conceptual reasons how this could be uh, useful. The other is market failures. There could be some failure, some barrier that you're helping firms overcome. This is really important during the Great Recession when there are credit constraints. There might be honest to God companies that would love to expand, but they can't get the credit to do that. And that's exactly when you'd observe the, these incentives are helpful. Um, and then finally, and I put it in, in red because you don't actually see this that much in the academic literature, but you hear it all the time talked about. Again, I lived in St. Louis for 12 years. They are obsessed with you guys in Kansas. What you're doing, 
what's the competition, what sort of policies are you doing? But if you actually read the academic research, for the most part, this is not a compelling logic for the offering of incentives. It's a compelling logic to make your business environment better. Right? It's a compelling argument to think about the efficiency. But even if there wasn't that competition, you should still be trying to make your business environment better. So the point being is don't let competition drive you into a set of policies that aren't necessarily wealth promoting or efficiency promoting in your community. So that's, again, a bit of the econ how the economics literature talks about it. What are the big cases against incentives? And as you can probably tell from my tone, I'm, I'm more on this side with serious concerns about the use of incentives. You know, the first one is that ineffective. So the, the research shows that in general, most incentives are offered to firms that were coming anyways, or an expansion that was gonna happen anyways. Minnesota just did an audit of their incentive program. They found two thirds of the incentives were given to firms that were already there, or already had planned to invest. They didn't really, they weren't really gonna leave, or they weren't really evaluating an alternative location. Right? The global research shows that it's actually closer to three quarters. About three quarters of, of incentives are offered. So if you calculate job per incentive, don't look at the number of jobs were created, because about three fourths of those were coming anyways or two thirds were coming anyways, right? So it's, it's very difficult to actually make the case that these are an especially effective, it's a blunt tool, you throw enough cash on the table, there's some com companies that will come that wouldn't have come anyways, but there's a whole lot of companies that are gonna get some cash to do what they were gonna do anyways. Um, the other is that it's expensive. Uh, any of you who watch the Winter Olympics, you can attract an Olympic venue with enough cash Right? Just like you could attract a company with enough, you put a billion dollars on the table, you'll get a company. But it doesn't mean that's good economic policy. And often it's a question about the cost and benefit of these incentives. Even if other states are doing it, does it mean you should? Right? If they're gonna pay so much money to attract a company, it might be better for you to repurpose that same amount of resources for something else. Right? This is what we call the winner's curse. Right? Sometimes winning a bid is actually the worst possible thing for you if you spent so much money to do it. And then finally, distorting, and someone asked this about moral hazard. Um, this was actually one of my biggest concerns about the proposal. And I have to say, you know, I flew in last night and I got the latest version of the proposal in my hotel room at 10 p.m. Um, but I was reading it, you know, and, and it's amazing to see this process because, and I, and I mean this in a positive way, there wasn't a whole lot in the first proposal I saw, and then there's been a whole bunch more filled out. There's been some real, real serious effort to think hard about how do we attract real companies that, uh, that generate real jobs in this community. But one of the things that I was worried about is this definition of primary jobs, right? If we really think only about jobs that generate um, sort of exports, if you wanna think of that way. I have a buddy of mine who's a, he's a physical therapist in St. Louis, started his own company, then he built a second company. They totally serve people in the St. Louis area. Now he started to travel around the country to start to work with doctors, training them, mostly he's, works with runners, so it's very high-end physical therapy, but they also have a medical services company. I guarantee you in a couple years, he's gonna have a few more businesses in St. Louis like this, and he'll probably expand outside of St. Louis. Would he get one of these incentives? Is he considered generating primary jobs? I think, again, the worry is that you might distort the types of jobs that are created here, and you know, isn't it great for your community to have a great healthcare? or things that your local community consumes. So I have a little bit of a concern. I understand the logic behind it, why you don't want to displace existing companies, but also you have to think about the, the unintended possible consequences by, of focusing on primary uh, jobs. And the other thing is, an academic, how do I get paid? I get a salary. How do they know how good I am? Uh, eventually you get hired by another university and you get a pay raise and either you leave or you stay and your existing university gives you a pay raise to stay. This is actually generating some problems in academia where you have a lot of professors that go in on the market to collect bids to try to get offers. Why is this a problem? One, you have a lot of people expending a lot of energy trying to get offers. But two, once people actually go on the market, I'm underpaid at Washington University. You know what, I gotta get an outside offer. And you go interview at a bunch of places and you say, you know what, it's actually quite nice here. I'm actually gonna think, and we've had this happen over and over again. So just imagine the scenario where you have an incentive program where you only counter other cities' incentives. You could very well be telling firms, go get offers, and then we'll match them. And once they start to go get offers, they're gonna be going to Oklahoma City or Memphis, 
and say, you know what, this is a pretty nice location. There are lots of unintended consequences of these sort of, uh, of actions, and you have to be careful. And I'm not saying that this is, these are bad policies, but you should debate this, and you should think really, really, really hard about it. Um, I'm burning a, lot of, burning a lot of time in my um, setup here. So let me focus something, you know, do incentives work? And I, I put it in quotes work because you can think about a lot of different ways that we can measure incentives. Most of the work's focused on job creation. And here's the tough part. And if you, if you just remember something from this talk, um, you know, one thing you can think about is how hard it is to think about incentives. Now, let's imagine you started a college scholarship program. And all you want to do is get kids who wouldn't go to college into college. That's your goal. That is really hard to do. Why? Because if you give those scholarships to valedictorians, you're probably giving scholarships to people who are going to college anyways. And you give scholarships to the worst students in the class, they're, they're either not going to go to college or they're only going to college because you gave them money. Ideally, you would target the students who are really good, they really want to go to college, all they need is just a little bit more and they would go. But doing that targeting is incredibly, incredibly difficult. And that's what you're trying to do here with, a, with an incentive program. You're trying really hard to think about what would actually generate more jobs. I'm not trying to pay you for the jobs you're doing anyways. And this is why some college scholarship programs are successful because they say, we're not just trying to get people to go to college. We're trying to get poor people to not have so many student loans. That's easier to do, right? If you're trying to lower the cost, if you're trying to lower the cost of generating jobs in Kansas, you want to give firms money back for the jobs they're going to create anyways, easy to do. You're trying to get them to generate new jobs. It's hard to do. Um, the other issue, again, with any incentive program, we call this non-random selection. I was the director of our PhD program. We'd get really smart kids come into our PhD program. They'd leave really smart. And I would say, boy, did I do a great job. And it's quite plausible I did nothing. I was just getting the best and smartest students and sent them out, and they were still the best and smartest students. Well, here's the problem with an incentive program. If you have a program that evaluates whether or not a firm is going to expand, you're only going to get applications from firms that are already thinking about expanding. Right? Again, hopefully this is pretty obvious to you guys, but often in the evaluations, if you care, compare the incentive firms versus the non-incentive non firms, that's not the right comparison. The right comparison are, are there firms that wanted to, that they really wanted to expand, and the incentive got them to do it. Right? Otherwise, we're having a pretty false comparison. And what I'm trying to do in this project is to be as honest as possible to how exactly do we analytically compare a major incentive program, an incentive program that, give, that gives large benefits to individual firms with some clear accounting, uh, the, some, cl some clear compliance required. So it's not that I think there's, there's cheating going on or I th think that there's something illegal or underhanded. It's just, let's look, what, what do these firms look like? Are these the superstar firms once you give them money? Do they look like they did something new after you gave them an incentive, or do they look just like any other firm? So how do we evaluate this? Well, there's a couple ways. One is, in a, you know, I call it an assumption-driven model. You can have a model where you say this type of uh, job is worth this amount to the community, or you could say this sort of job generates four or five other jobs in addition to it, this is often auto plants, you know, one auto job is worth seven indirect jobs. You can have these sort of models and use this as a starting point, but as it should be obvious by the title, they're really, really sensitive to the assumptions, right? What you say, right, when you set up the model is really determines how you evaluate that. So you have to defend the assumptions. The other is what we call a diff and diff. This is, again, nerdy academic terms, just looking at differences over time. Right, so we have a community that has no program and then has a new program. And how do things change from point one to point two? The problem is sometimes that this can be difficult as well if lots of other things are changing. Right? If the whole reason you're putting an incentive program in place is because you've lost, you're losing lots of jobs, it's hard to say whether or not that incentive program is effective. So what I've done here in this study is what's called matching. And it's sort of like a, my three-year-old, I can't wait for us to do science experiments. We're going to have two little plants, and I'm going to water one, and I'm not going to water the other. And show them that a plant, you know, we've got a control group, and we've got an experimental group. That's what I'm trying to do here. But rather than, you know, having two plants we can water or not water, we can use data. We can look at all the establishments in, in Kansas and look at the firms that got incentives 
and look for firms that are as similar as possible that didn't get incentives? And how did job growth change across those groups? Did the incentive companies have more jobs? How many more jobs? What's the cost per job compared to the, the, the companies that didn't get incentives? Because what you're going to see here is the companies that didn't get incentives also generated jobs. Right? This, is, this is obvious. But did the incentivized companies generate more jobs? I'm, this is probably violates all the details of, uh, of a PowerPoint slide. What's the, what's, the big, what's the big point here? And I'll speak from away from the mi microphone. All we want to do is use data, right? We use existing data of companies in Kansas. And for every company that got an incentive, we look for five companies that look similar. And when I say we look for five companies, I don't trust myself to look through 500,000 companies and say, oh, that one, that one, that one, that one. We actually pre-specify what exactly do we want to compare them to. I want to pick companies that are very similar on a number of dimensions in terms of the size. I want to compare two firms that are roughly the same size of employment. Actually, in this data set, exactly the same size of employment before the incentives. I want to look at firms that are in the exact same industry. And that's the starting point of this matching. Right? But we can actually add more details and more details, especially when we have hundreds of thousands uh, of firms in this data set, and then do it again. Right, resample another five set of firms and look over and over again with, with the goal of saying, we just want to look how do these peak incentivized firms look different. There's a bunch of other ways you can do this. I actually have it in a paper. Um, there's a bunch of other different ways that essentially have different modeling assumptions, but the logic's the same. We want to control for the fact that the firms that got peak incentives were pretty big to begin with. right? They're big firms that were well connected, or they're big firms that were already growing in a, in a growing industry, right? We want to be careful. So I use data, and this is from the Kauffman Foundation. The Kauffman Foundation funded this this research project, this single research project, and the big thing that they did was they purchased data for me. Now, they actually purchased data for a number of researchers, including all the Kansas company establishment data and all the Missouri establishment data. And I'm doing a, a, a companion paper on the Missouri, uh, the main Missouri investment promotion project. And then comparing the main Kansas incentive program. And then again, what's it look like? We've got about 100 firms in the sample that received incentives. On average, they're $2 million per firm. On average, it's about 90 some jobs. And most of these companies promised, we, well, I actually got their original applications, promised to generate these jobs in the first year, right? About 55% of the jobs are going to be created right away, which means in terms of a policy evaluation, it makes it pretty easy for me. Like these firms could say, well, we're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. That's why we don't have jobs. They, they should be there, right? Those jobs that were promised should already be there. So if you look at, you know, just do a naive comparison. Let me grab the firms that got peak incentives and compare them to all the other firms in Kansas, sure enough, they generated more jobs over a, a six-year time period than the not peak jobs. But this is not controlling for what I just said was the problem, right? These might be firms in dynamic industries. These might be big, big firms that already generate. So let's do the matching. So when we compare similar jobs, the peak firms actually generate five less jobs per company. And then when we add the industry, we actually find the average, the average incentive actually generated 45 fewer jobs. This is not to say that, you know, I always joke that this is not like headline, peak incentives kills jobs, right? The point being is that there's no statistically difference. There's no statistically significant difference between the firms that got incentives and those that didn't, right? From a policy evaluation, it looks like you're giving money to firms to do what they were going to do anyways. That's at least one interpretation of these results. So that's the main part of my pre presentation. Um, I've done a bunch of other work on the data analysis side. And the neat thing about this, hopefully, is that I can separate out the firms that were actually not jumping the border across Kansas and Missouri. Most of these firms are actually for expansion. They're existing Kansas firms that wanted expansion. Um, but there's some brand new firms, and there's some firms that move back and, fo back and forth across the border. If you look at the, the data, the latest data that I had, um, that there is some incentive, sorry, that should be attracting new firms. If you actually look at, like, how is this peak program used, it's actually the story of the border war. If you actually look at the type of foreign investment 
that Kansas gets. You get an investment from all over the place. If you look at the type of investments Kansas gets from around the country, you get investment from all around the country. You look at this peak program, it mostly gets investment from Missouri. Right? It's a program, again, when I said distorting. What type of jobs are you generating? You you, you're generating the type of jobs that are jumping 5, 6, 7, 10, 15 miles across the border. Right? It's exactly the sort of distortion that we worry about. Now, this is a single program. Um, I can't really say um, whether or not this would be the same in other programs. Um, what's the problem with this work? And I'm just being my honest, like what have people told me? Um, one is that this method is pretty obvious. It's pretty standard. I've done a bunch of different methods. You know, in, in academia, you always want to be extra creative. You want to do something new, cutting edge. And they said, yeah, this is standard policy analysis. You know, good for you, but come on, give me something cooler. Um, the other is, you know, how representative is Kansas? And, and that's a good question, and, and I'm actually doing a companion piece in Missouri. Um, but the biggest thing that I've got the criticism of, I keep emailing this to people, and I, I actually emailed someone, a new colleague at George Washington University. He said, I published a paper like this in 1978. I said incentives didn't work then. Um, which is a little, you know, a little frustrating because I put so much work uh, into this project. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it's in some sense, if you want a takeaway from this, you know, I think the takeaway from this is basically that this is pretty close to what a lot of the re research has shown. Um, in my paper that I've, I, I'll, I'll make sure that if, if you want to link it from the Kauffman Foundation, I have a bunch of literature review on it. Um, there's actually a new paper that came out recently and that's a great overview. It's a very technical uh, economics sort of paper uh, with including formal models of, of place-based policies. Um, but it's something, again, there's, there's a lot of literature you can look at. I'm just saying mine's not too out of the ordinary and that's actually bad for my career. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to do, and, and I got, I got you know, details from this um, last night, so I wanted to skip a couple slides because I think there's a lot of details on oversight. And, and I think this is great, right? But I think, again, often when people look at these incentive programs, there's often the, I don't know, the, the knee-jerk reaction, this has to be corruption, it's gotta be collusion, um, it's about campaign contributions. We actually match campaign contributions as data and we don't find anything in terms of do the campaign contributors get better incentives. The problem is the big companies are often campaign contributors, right? But often when you, that doesn't mean the contribution affected incentives. We actually got some data from Texas, the Texas Enterprise Fund, this huge enterprise fund, and I looked at accepted and rejected applications and campaign contributions had no impact whether you got accepted or rejected. So this is not kicking sand saying that there's corruption in the process. The problem is it's a really, really hard thing to do. And having you know, a really good oversight panel of people you trust is fantastic. But what are they going to do exactly? What exact data are you going to give them access to? And that's one of the things that I wanted to quickly pitch. One, um, the Kansas legislature has, a, they have an evaluation of their incentive program. It's a three-part series um, on their, their incentive programs. It's like I was joking with someone, you know, the Bible only gets two parts, but the Kansas legislature has a three-part series on their incentive program. And that's because that's how contentious it is. The legislature evaluating their own incentive program and in the first part, there's a whole appendix of back and forth between, no, no, those aren't jobs. Yes, they are jobs. No, they aren't jobs. There's a debate about what are jobs, why did some of these companies drop out, a lot of after the fact back and forth about, from different parties and what happened. I think what a lot of academic scholarship has done is take this off the table by pre-establishing your metrics. And don't, you know, I don't mean like hazy, we're gonna compare how many jobs we created. Make it concrete as possible. And this is how it happens in medicine all the time. We're gonna do a, a trial of this drug and we're gonna specify not just what we're gonna measure, but whether we're gonna, how we're gonna evaluate whether this treatment is effective. It's gonna be statistically sig significant at 95% and put that in your proposal, right? So a year after when you start to evaluate these policies, you don't have to have this debate, right? Because there's lots of interested parties, but there's also people with different perspectives, right? And they're gonna see, look at the same data in a different way. Take it off the table and put it. And if you can't specify together how to evaluate, that's also a problem, right? If you can't even come to terms what a successful program looks like. Um, you have lots of reporting requirements. I actually threw a, a FOIA request, or I should say the Hall Family Foundation in Kansas City threw a FOIA request, got the actual applications for these incentive programs. So don't just tell me about who was funded. I wanna see who gets rejected, who gets accepted, and I wanna see what's in the proposal. Right? in the sense of what year-by-year -year jobs are being proposed. 
And that makes policy evaluation much, much easier. And not just for an internal committee, again, make this publicly available, right? Applications available. And again, accepted and rejected. Um, through a FOIA request, Texas Enterprise Fund, they gave me data on the rejected applications and accepted. I made a number of other states requests. They did not keep data on the rejected applications, right? So it makes it really difficult to evaluate because the rejected applications, that's the perfect control group. Those are the ones who tried to get incentives, said they wanted to expand, but they didn't get money. And then you can do some additional data work. And James, I don't know if I should wrap up here very quickly. This is a very busy slide, and I actually left it as a printout. If I was in your position thinking about what would have the best possible evaluation, and I'm not taking a position on whether you should have this jobs program or not, but how should you set up the evaluation? First of all, if you're going to have this you know, 20,000 job benchmark, it should be relative to a set of cities. You should have an index of cities. What are your competitor cities? And you should look at your relative job growth relative to those index of cities. So 20,000 jobs to me sounds like a number. I, I, it probably came from a very serious analysis. I would love to see that up front, right? And say, you know, rather than a specified number, we're putting all this money in, we should have 10% more jobs than this index of other new job creation than this index of other cities. Right? That's one way to do it. But then I think the rich part is if you're going to actually give incentives to individual firms, build in the evaluation right away. Tell me what a job is, right? as concrete as possible. Right? How are you going to make sure that they're documented? Are you going to use payroll information? How are projects selected? Again, this sounds like you have a very open process. Ideally, again, you would show us that, the, the initial applications. Because we know often if there's an open process that firms might self-select whether or not they want to apply in the first place. Right? So what we want to get is the paper trail of when a firm first applies. Um, what's the metric for success? success? What's the metric for failure? Right? And that's a really important point as well. How would you know whether this program didn't work? Right? And if you say, if this, job, this program does not generate an additional 15 jobs per set amount of dollars, that this has been an ineffective program. Do this up front, right? And do this above board with all the community leaders. Again, this is amazing the amount of energy that's gone into this proposal. And just go that additional step and specify as much as possible.